Welcome, everybody. It's great to see so many here at the end of a beautiful sunny day. Spring is in the air, I think. Fingers crossed. There was a hint of green on the ground. Tonight, I want to give special thanks to Concordia's Teacher Education Department for their participation in the program. And I also always like to thank Friends of Concordia because their support makes these programs possible. And tonight, I want to give special thanks to Concordia friend and community member Carolyn Dreisnack, who introduced me to the Snow Queen. Uh, um, I'm sorry, Charlie, in my. Uh, the Snow Queen's Daughter, My Life with Asperger's, A Tale from the Lost Generation. It's these thoughtful community connections that make these engaging author series possible. So thank you so much. I've asked Dr. Stephanie Squires to introduce um, our author tonight. She is director of Concordia's master's program in special education and the Vicki Ford Associate Professor of Education. Uh, she holds a doctorate in special education from the University of New Orleans. She's been a classroom teacher for students with autism and worked at the college university level since 1986, serving both as a faculty member and administrator of federal and state grants. She was instrumental in Concordia's efforts to obtain state education approval for the college's master's programs, and enrollment continues to increase under her leadership. Dr. Squires remains active in her field, conducting workshops for parents of children with disabilities, helping them gain access for educational services for their, daughter, for their children. These are educational services that might have benefited our author had they been available at the time when she was growing up. Please join me in welcoming Stephanie Squires. Thank you. I'm delighted to be a part of tonight's Books and Coffee program, and I am honored to introduce our guest, Charlie Devnett, author of The Snow Queen's Daughter. Today, most people are familiar with the word autism. But in 1944, when Austrian psychiatrist Hans Asperger first described his research, autism was virtually unheard of. Not until 1981, when British psychiatrist Lorna Wing translated Asperger's findings and described them in her own published paper, did the world begin to understand and know about Asperger's syndrome. Both Asperger and Wing presented strong evidence that autism should be understood as a spectrum of disorders, some dramatically different from others, but sharing common roots. Autism spectrum disorder is a word or term that we often use today. Now, consider in the midst of these two dates, 1944 and 1981, in 1973, and then again in 1975, two very important federal laws were passed that provided support for students with disabilities. The first law, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, and Public Law 94142, now known as IDEA or IDEA. IDEA requires school districts to provide a free and public, a free appropriate public education regardless of the nature or severity of the disability. The, the intention of Congress is clear in the 1970s, but the knowledge, experience, and capacity for diagnosing and educating these students with within this broad spectrum of disabilities lagged behind. Charlie Devnet grew up in this gap in a time when parents, educators, and medical experts lacked the knowledge, experience, and methods that we have today. And so she struggled to understand her place in the world. C.S. Lewis said, we read to know we are not alone. Charlie Devnet writes so others may know they are not alone. With courage and honesty, she shares her struggles with feelings of frustration, 
helplessness, isolation, and loneliness. But her story is not all sorrow. She shares her moments of triumph and pleasure as well. Her book also serves as an important lesson for educators. Our work is important. Here at Concordia, we focus in on that important lesson each day as we educate future teachers who will make a difference in children's lives and in the lives of their families. Please join me in welcoming Charlie Devnan to Concordia College. Um. Hello, um, I wanted to thank uh, everyone at Concordia for inviting me and giving me the opportunity tonight. Um, my name is Charlie, I'm autistic, um, but I didn't know that until uh, 2010. Um, a member of the WASP generation. Now, the term the WASP generation is a term uh, coined in 2007 by uh, Cambridge autism expert, Dr. Simon Baron Cohen, to describe people that grew up before the diagnosis of Asperger's was available, which in the United States wasn't until 1994. So if you grew up and you left school before that, chances were um, you were going to be diagnosed late in life, if ever, and uh, your life would be quite tragic because you would not know why you were different. Now, I always knew I was different from other people. I just didn't know why. Um, when I was finally diagnosed, my uh, therapist gave me some books to read, and these were by other adult Aspies or people with Asperger's. And uh, there was Leanne Wiley's Pretending to Be a Normal. There were books by Michael John Carley. But the, although these books were helpful, I found that these were people who were um, what I would consider nearly normal. And I thought that the people that aren't nearly normal need a uh, voice too. So I, I started writing my memoirs basically as a therapeutic exercise to put it all down. Um, you may remember recently the um, singer Susan Boyle reported that at the age of 52, she also had been diagnosed with Asperger's, and she reported that uh, there was such a feeling of empowerment and uh, liberation to uh, finally discover what is wrong with you. And uh, that was my experience. And I have the experience of many adult Aspies who were diagnosed late in life that I have talked to. My story is also different because um, I did not start down here and gradually go up and get things got better. Things got worse. Uh, as a child, I was here, and then I had a severe drop and a regression. And for 40 years, I just tried to rediscover myself and find my place in the world. Uh, there were autistic children uh, when I was young, but they were uh, confused with mentally retarded. They were called retards, and um, no one ever would possibly consider me autistic because I, um, I was cursed with a high IQ. And I say cursed because that was one of the reasons that, one of the things that made me separate from other people. And uh, the uh, hard fought battle and the goal of, of my uh, childhood was to become just like other people, uh, ultimately doomed. Um, you know, some people say they, uh, someone peaked in high school. I actually peaked in seventh grade. <laughs> Until then, um, I had basically, as a child, uh, a life that, in retrospect, and compared to the years that were to follow, seems almost idyllic. I, um, I had problems. I was an emotional brat. Um, of course, in those days, you were blamed for your own brattiness. I, did, I um, misbehaved all the time. I think I misbehaved in school a lot because I was bored. I, of course, I, I read it at the age of four, and, and you know, when we went to first grade, and people were learning the alphabet, you know, it was, it was just quite boring to me. I, I tried to pretend I was not smart and that I didn't know the alphabet, but in the end, you know, I, I, I acted out. I had trouble getting along with other people, although as a child I did have my own friends. I lived in a community that, uh, where there were a lot of, uh, it was the baby boom, and there was a lot of, 
young kids my age. I had a best friend who lived next door. Her name was Alexis. Um, um, and I also did benefit from the freedom that was granted to children in the, in the 60s. In the 60s, um, you could get on your bike, leave in the morning, and come back home at night. Your parents didn't expect to know where you were every moment of the day. And if they, you weren't going to tell them. If you came home by supper time, that was OK. Um, Alexis was a latchkey a child that was even better. So if we went over to her house after school, we had the whole place to ourselves. And it was like being part of the Peanuts gang. And, um, and also, um, freedom meant that you weren't a sitting duck. If you were being bullied, if you were having problems with the other kids, you could just get on your bike and ride somewhere. I had a lot of aunts and uncles uh, in the prox uh, proximate area. And uh, they all uh, were uh, glad to see me. And uh, I enjoyed my freedom. I went to the library a lot. It's in the library that uh, I really got my education. I never really learned anything in school. I, I consider school just a place where you had to go um, when you were young and you weren't uh, qualified to take your place in the world. But I learned things in the public library. I still do. Um, just this winter, I was, learned all about Google Docs. Now, um, I was troubled by bullies. And I didn't know why people were bullying me. And uh, that was a big, uh, a big part of, of my life, you know. And I, I kind of knew that they were bullying me. I kind of sensed that they were bullying me because I was not like them. That's the way kids are. They tend to bully. The, they have radar. They pick up the person that's different in some way. And that's the person that they pick on. And uh, I just didn't know why. I thought uh, they. The teacher singled me out for discipline a lot, but I know a lot of, a lot of boys misbehaved, and they were heroes to the other kids. Uh, Alexis said, well, you're, you're a little bit chubby, and maybe that was true, but I wasn't so that you would get picked on. And I thought, at one point, I thought it was because I was an only child. Everybody else had siblings. Uh, when I was six years old, I went to school one day, and you had to draw pictures of your siblings. And the few people that didn't have siblings drew pictures of their pets. I had neither pets nor siblings. So I thought, oh, this, is, this really stigmatizes me. I went home and I asked my mother. I petitioned her for a little brother or sister. Uh, now my mother, who always said no, said yes, and uh, in short order presented me with a little brother. Now this was the happiest day of my life. I thought I was going to be like Wally and the Beaver. <laughs> this was the one pal that would always be there for me. Unfortunately, it didn't turn out that way. He was uh, totally indifferent to me. He just lacked the gene for sisterhood or brotherhood. And he, I couldn't pick him out of a police lineup. Uh, my brother, I believe, is autistic too, although he's never been diagnosed. Um, when I grew up, and after, I mean, after I was diagnosed long after I grew up, when I went to Asperger support groups and I met adult Aspies, male Aspies, and I could, the, the resemblance to my brother is just, shot me. He's, um, he's very much more withdrawn than I am. He's way back. He's soft-spoken. Uh, he had one of his one special interest in life. He liked music. As a baby, he would go around the house singing Snap, Crackle, Pop and the jingles. And when he got older, he never had any friends. He just locked himself in, the, um, locked himself in his bedroom when he came home and played records. Fortunately for my brother, um, my parents sent him to private school. Um, they saw what happened to me when I was a teenager, and they didn't want it to happen to my brother. So they sent him to private school. He did get uh, guidance that I didn't get. And he went to good schools, good colleges, and he was able to find his niche in the world and became a music journalist in Boston. Um, I couldn't call him a success because for the last couple of years, he's been unemployed. But also, since I wrote the book, he got married. So that's um, half a dozen of one and half a dozen of the other. <laughs> Now, as for me, what happened to me um, as a child, you know, um, although I had struggles and troubles, um, by the time I was in seventh grade, I, it was my year of normalization. I, I almost achieved my goal of being like everybody else, or at least being able to pass like everybody else. I had managed to confront the bullies. I had stopped behaving in a, a erratic fashion. So the teachers no longer sent me to the principal's office every day. And I had um, stopped walking funny and talking funny. And so the other kids tended to 
be more accepting. And I had, uh, I was on good terms with my best friend, Alexis. Uh, Alexis was one of the best things about my childhood, but we would have an off again, on again relationship. Uh, every now and then I would say something that I didn't know inadvertently and uh, she would disappear for a couple months only, you know, until one day I swallowed my pride and I'd go over and apologize to her. So um, in seventh grade, uh, I was closer to normalization than I ever would be before. I also had a self-confidence that I, I was shortly to lose. What happened that following summer, the year I turned 13, my parents sold our home in my hometown, Croton on Hudson, and they moved upstate to a uh, ruined Gothic estate in, uh, overlooking the Hudson River. And suddenly I lost everything, my aunts and uncles, my little village where I could bike around, you know, all the friends I knew, my school. It was all gone. I had absolutely nobody to talk to. Um, there was nothing there. I still had my bike, but we were out in the country. There was nowhere to go, nothing to do. And I just crashed. I, I regressed. And um, when I was a teenager, I developed a stim, as I still have it. I became very... Uh, a, you know, I became very withdrawn. Um, Tony Atwood, the um, expert in Asperger's syndrome in females, he talks about girls who, um, as a defensive mechanism, withdraw into a world of their own, and that's what I did. I, I was oh, such so overcome by loneliness and homesickness and uh, boredom, and I just could not. It, the world about me was unbearable. I created a world for my own, and I withdrew. Uh, now, this should have signaled to my parents that something was wrong, but it didn't. Well, it sort of did. They, one day, they took me out of school, and they put me into a hospital, not a mental hospital, but a regular hospital, and uh, as if there was something physically wrong with me. And I was confined to the hospital for six days. Um, uh, also, I had started my periods just before we moved when I was 12. And when we moved, I just stopped. I also stopped growing. Um, I had attained my full height of five foot four. Before we moved, I had been one of the tallest people in the class as a child. Uh, as an adult, I'm quite short. So everything just sort of stopped for me. And my parents thought I had something physically wrong with me. Uh, the only thing that the doctors found was that like, I had a sluggish metabolism. And so they gave me metabolism supplements, thyroid supplements. but. Um, they didn't find out anything, you know. Of course, they didn't know at the time. They didn't have words to describe it. Uh, it was also probably at this time that I began to suffer from depression and anxiety, which is our conditions that many Aspies do suffer from. Uh, but I, I, I wouldn't have known, you know, that these were medical conditions. I thought I was just sad because I was lonely and that, you know, I was anxious because then I was up in a scary place in the middle of nowhere. Now, um, as bad as high school was, and also there were new bullies in high school. And these were different than the bullies I had known as a child, bullies who chased me around the courtyard and the school and, and tried to grab my homework and throw my books in the mud. These were bullies who just ignored me. I had to take the school bus and there were bullies who would just sit down and talk over me as if I wasn't there, reinforcing the idea that I really wasn't there. And uh, so, you know, these were not bullies you could deal with. You can't confront somebody that pretends you're not there. But as bad as high school was, uh, alas, college was even worse. I was not ready to go to college. I, I certainly had no, no skills to, to go up as an adult in the wide world. But I was just expected to go to college. I was totally unemployable. And even though I dragged my feet for six months and I said I'd get a job, but I never did because I had no skills. So in the end, I went to college, and um, college was even worse because at least my parents had provided me some structure, and structure in life is very important to somebody on the autistic spectrum. Uh, you know, at least my parents had made sure I got up at a reasonable hour, that I ate three meals a day, that I dressed, you know, reasonably presentably, and, uh, you know, went off to school. But without them, without any structure in my life, I, I just went wild. I tried to become a student revolutionary. <laughs> I uh, thought that was a way to um, re recover the old me, you know, to become, uh, I was tired of, of being withdrawn and just being a victim, and, and I thought that I would, like, become a Patty Hearst type and 
or a Che Guevara type, and, and that, uh, that didn't work out too well. Now, um, I was rescued, or I found rescue. When after I finally got out of college, I got a college degree. I think I got thrown out of a couple colleges, one for stalking, one for uh, making terroristic threats, although they didn't use the words, that, those words then. Um, they just probably said I, they thought I had issues. But when I, I finally, one college gave me a degree and just get out of here. And then I'm in my early 20s and I'm totally unemployable and I don't know what to do. Um, the whole idea of going to a job interview was, you know, just totally frightening. I didn't know what I wanted to do in life. Um, I had no guidance. So I went back to my hometown and I moved in with my father's sister, Aunt Rose. And Aunt Rose devoted the last 30 years of her life to rescuing me. And that I'm able to become even a marginally productive member of society is, is due totally to Aunt Rose. <laughs> um, but it was not easy. Um, she used to tell me about St. Monica, who prayed for St. Augustine for years and years and years. Uh, St. Augustine apparently was a profligate and he was somewhat rebellious and uh, a no good Nick. And she prayed for him and prayed for him for many years until he saw the light, and, and she hoped that I would do that too. So with her help, I was able to um, put together a string of part-time and per diem jobs, even though I had several advanced degrees. Uh, that is not an uncommon uh, pattern for, for people with Asperger's, uh, that if they work at all, they generally tend to uh, work on the margins. But at least I was able to put together enough work to, um, to make myself feel productive. And to, uh, I did a lot of oddball jobs. I uh, worked for about 20 years with, a, uh, with Varsity Studios. We did prom photographs. Um, I, I worked at a night cricket as a, in a motel. I took order, telephone orders for uh, Federal Jobs Digest. And then um, I worked as, at my, actually my profession was, was as, as in the legal field and I worked as a, a paralegal and um, that's uh, actually I was an aspiring lawyer but at uh, my legal career uh, for unfortunately um, failed to launch because of several mistakes I made. Um, and particularly one involving a handsome young desperado. If that's in the book. <laughs> now, um, the next real crisis in my life, and the crisis that led to my being diagnosed, was because I lost my parents within four years of each other, and then two years after that I lost Aunt Rose. Now, the subject of parental loss, as it affects people on the autism spectrum, I wish there would be more attention paid to that. Uh, I've talked to other people, uh, other adults, Aspies, and uh, you know they report the same, similar experiences to what I have. Losing your parents is traumatic for anybody, but um, the truth is that by the time most people are in their 40s and 50s, they have families of their own, they have careers of their own. Losing your parents, although it, it may be uh, very Difficult, it's not the end of the world. But uh, for us, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, we're living with our parents far into middle age um, for financial reasons, maybe for social reasons. Maybe we don't have any friends or any relationships, and our parents are really our only social life and the only people we have in our lives to love. And uh, once you lose your parents um, or your caregiver, it's, it's um, and you're on your own for the first time in your life at the age of 50 or so, that's, that's quite a, a shock. Now, um, I had a rocky relationship with my parents, um, but and I blamed them for destroying my life by taking me away from my childhood support system, moving me up to the Kingdom of Frost, a place where I had nobody and nothing, um, by allowing my brother to simply write me off of his life. But there came a time that I, I forgave my parents. And um, that was one of the most important things I did, I think, during the time I lived with Aunt Rose. That was one of the most important things I did to heal myself. Now, all my life I had been collecting stories of good parents <laughs> to sort of hold up as an example to my parents. 
And, but uh, at about the same time, I ran into two sets of parents who uh, had diametrically opposed stories and that each were like fables with morals to me. Uh, one, um, the lady's name was Julie, her son was Vinny. Uh, I used one of my part-time jobs was I, I used to work at the polling and the election uh, centers and the polling uh, registrar. I worked with this older lady named Julie. She used to talk about her son Vinny. She used to talk about how she had to get home and put out Vinny's medication, wash his clothes, uh, make sure he had supper, drive Vinny here, drive Vinny there. You know, oh Vinny, Vinny, Vinny. I thought Vinny was this poor little boy until she did, I discovered he was only a few few years younger than myself. <laughs> uh, and uh, I was interested in Vinny because um, Vinny's story was a lot like mine. See, after we moved and after I crashed and regressed, uh, all my parents could say to me, especially my mother, she's, well, my mother said to me, uh, way into adulthood, she would say this to me. She would say, other kids move, other kids' parents, they, you know, they sell their homes, they move, they, their companies transfer them, and the kids adjust. Only you. Only you uh, couldn't cope. You never made any new friends. You, you know, it was the end of the world for you. That was only you. And when I met Vinny, or heard of Vinny, and uh, I came across a story that was very similar to mine. Vinny had been a teenager in high school in Long Island. He had uh, been in a band, and according to his mother, he'd been a very happy, thriving teenager when they moved up to Croton. And same thing that happened to me happened to Vinny. But his parents were uh, college educated. They were more uh, involved than my own parents. And they took Vinny to all sorts of child psychiatrists. And of course, if uh, Vinny, as he well may be, he may have Asperger's, but of course there was no diagnosis for that at the time. Vinny was diagnosed and probably misdiagnosed as a manic depressive. And he was put at the age of 17 on heavy duty medications. At that point, Vinny's life was um, as a productive human being was pretty much over. Um, he spent his life hanging out in bars, um, doing drugs, living with his mom, you know. He had a couple poor time jobs as a, like a stock boy, but most of the time he just hang, hung around. And uh, the last time I saw Vinny, he's about 50, and uh, his mom was uh, unfortunately, you know, she's elderly, and I don't know what's when it was going to happen to him. The other story uh, was uh, the father was named Paul, the son was named Damien. Uh, during my uh, years living with Aunt Rose, I, at one point I played volleyball in the Croton Rec Department program. It was one of my efforts to make friends. I didn't really make any friends. I did learn to play volleyball. And uh, one of the people that played, the, one of the regulars was uh, um, from Austin. He was uh, an accountant. His name was Paul. He had a teenage son named Damien, a very cute boy and a very uh, personable boy, and uh, used to bring Damien with him sometimes. And Damien uh, went to Austin High. He got into some trouble. I don't know whether it was drugs or bullies or behavioral problems, but he apparently wasn't doing too well. So Paul and his wife sent Damien up to live with his aunt and uncle up in Hudson. And I thought, wow, these are the parents of the year. You know, I had begged, when I was a teenager, I begged my mother to let me go live with Aunt Rose and go to Croton High. You know, right up to the, my, to the time I graduated high school, I just, please let me go to Croton and, and go to junior, you know, Croton High, for at least for my senior year. And of course, my mother wouldn't, wouldn't consider it. But I thought, Paul and his wife doing the best thing for Damien and sending him away. You know, whoever loved their son so much. Unfortunately, the story did not have a happy ending. Damien up in Hudson fell in with uh, bad companions. Uh, he fell in with this boy named Wiley. He was a computer geek, a rather evil computer geek who wanted to kill his parents. And he got Damien and another boy involved in a conspiracy to kill his parents. Uh, Damien uh, got 20 years to life. Um, it doesn't help if you're a defense attorney if your client is named for Rosemary's baby. So uh, I don't know. Uh, the last I heard, Damien, they kept taking appeals after appeals. Uh, but uh, 20 years to life in New York means that you do at least 20 years. So with these two fables and these two examples, you know, I realize that even when parents try to do the right thing, that sometimes things don't work out right. 
and so I, I, I was able to see my parents different way. Also, um, I, in my late 30s, I had to go work with my parents. They had gotten into some legal trouble, and I had a law degree that I had picked up somewhere along the way, and I had to go help them out. And uh, of course, we, this brought up all sorts of tensions between us, because not only did I resent the fact that they had uh, destroyed my wife, but they resented the fact that I had disappointed them, that I was a little genius that had fallen flat on her face, and, you know, they were ashamed to be seen with me. You know, and all my cousins had turned, all my cousins who were not half so bright as I was, they had all turned out well. They had all married, had their own homes, had their own careers, and here I was still uh, hanging around and eking out of living from part-time jobs with no friends to speak of. So my parents and I, uh, we never really, we always had a very tentative relationship, but it, it did improve. And even though they were not the parents I could have asked for, or, you know, they had their, certainly had their defects as parents, it doesn't mean I didn't love them. Uh, in fact, uh, I think I loved them all the more because I had no one else, really. My parents and Aunt Rose, I had a couple friends as an adult that came and went, but nobody, nobody like Alexis in my childhood. And um, if I wanted to love somebody and to be loved, and, and my parents did love me in their own way. Um, my dad especially, he, um, I, I, I saw my dad differently. My dad had, um, I had had a great disdain for him when I was a child because he had never wanted to deal with any serious issues. He was not my advocate, he did not, he was not in my corner. Uh, he would not go to bat for me. Uh, he didn't want to talk as serious. He'd make small talk all day long, but if he brought up anything serious, he didn't want to hear about it. Uh, when I was older, I realized that my dad, uh, he had been a teenage Marine in World War II. We'd been in the Pacific Theater. And at that time, they didn't have uh, benefits for PTSD, and um, they didn't make a big thing out of it. But now I, I realize when he was old, right at the end of his life, he was diagnosed as, as having uh, a certain amount of PTSD, and that it probably manifested itself in uh, an unwillingness to, uh, to, to confront, to become confrontational. But after Aunt Rose died, and this is one, two, three, and, um, and when Aunt Rose died, it was utterly unbelievable, horrible. Not only were the circumstances surrounding her death quite horrible, which I've written in the book and I don't want to relive, but Aunt Rose had no children of her own, but she did have umpteen nieces and nephews. And um, you had umpteen nieces and nephews suddenly descending against me and they wanted me to get out of the house so they could sell it. And actually, I had uh, of 24 cousins, I had one that, that came to my rescue, came to my aid, that he was on my side. It was not my brother. My brother. <laughs> he was proud to be neutral, but uh, it didn't help me. I, um, I fought them as long as I could. Uh, Aunt Rose left, uh, Aunt Rose had three dogs. One of them survived her, and I thought this dog was like 16, a 16-year-old Asa Absol. I used to call him Mr. Speaker. He looked just like Newt Gingrich. And he should be allowed to live out his natural life at home. And I spent a year fighting for myself and the dog. Uh, I finally lost. I had to turn the dog over to my uh, evil cousin, Cruella. And uh, the dog was soon put down. Uh, but... Um, what saved me? What saved me? Well, um, there were basically three things, and I would say the first of them is my present job at Kaikit, that is the Rockefeller Estate. In '02, I stumbled into, on an ad in the Penny Saver. I was co basically collecting part-time jobs. I stumbled on an ad for tour guides for the Rockefeller Estate. Uh, Kaikit, I didn't know anything about it. I'd never been there. I knew something about the Rockefellers. Um, Nelson Rockefeller, my, my childhood governor, and uh, connected me, me with my childhood self, my real self, and uh, just his name was good, so I, I decided to apply. And I don't know how I got through the screening process, but uh, I walked out, and I, 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 um, I'm a tour guide at Kikets, and so too. Now, I did have problems. It wasn't easy. 
the way you see me now and talking to you like that, I, I appear perfectly at ease. But if you had seen me 15 years ago, well, no way. You know, I, I would have hung my head in shame. I could not have spoken out in public here. So it was difficult to me to become a tour guide. And the first year, I, I am afraid, um, I had a rocky relationship with my supervisors. But it was also the year that my mom died. My mom was 74. She died of lung cancer in rel relatively um, in short order uh, within a couple months. And uh, I could not believe it because until the day she died, she looked young and beautiful. And that was part of her allure. It's no queen. She, she looked like a 40s movie star and almost just until the day she died. And uh, I could not believe it. And if I hadn't had Kike, I don't know how I would have gotten over that. And four years after that, my, my dad died. And for some reason, that was even harder for me to take. I just could not cope with that. But then I had two years after that when I was trying to take care of Aunt Rose, and finally Aunt Rose died. And that, to me, that, you know, what am I going to live for? Nobody, there's nobody in this world that cares about me, and there wasn't. Um, my brother, totally indifferent. In fact, uh, when I forgave my parents, I never forgave my brother because of his total indifference. It was harder to harder to forgive. Um, so there really didn't seem any reason to go on. You know, I contemplated suicide. You know, I, but I had Kikit. I had my job at Kikit, and I, it was off season when Aunt Rose died, but I really wanted to go back. So I went to therapy and um, ended up getting diagnosed and finding out, finding out basically what was wrong with me. So you might say it was the culmination of a 40-year search for self-discovery. And the Greeks inscribed on the temple of Apollo, uh, know thyself, and knowing thyself is the essence of wisdom. And since I didn't know myself, all my other degrees, and I had several, and as you can, yeah, well, I have a law degree, I have a master's degree, I have, well, but they were all worthless. None of them ever helped me in my life as long as I was totally in the dark about my own self. Um, it was only when I knew myself and I discovered what I was really about that, that I was able, able to, to have some inner peace. To, uh, all my life I had borne a burden of shame for being the little genius that fell on her face, for not living up to expectations, for not being like other people. Having a diagnosis helped me get rid of that. I've talked to a lot of Aspies and how they feel about their diagnosis. The younger ones who were diagnosed young in life tend to uh, not to feel good about it. They rebel against it, and I can understand. Because as I said, as a child, my uh, ultimate goal was to be like everybody else. And I really would not have wanted to be diagnosed as a child, because that basically I would have felt that is like a, some kind of life sentence here. But as an adult, as an older adult, I was certainly very, um, very gratified to, to know what the problem was and to know why, my, why I had suffered such misfortune in life. So I decided to write my memoirs. And um, I chose the title, The Snow Queen's Daughter. Um, those of you that were alive in the 60s may remember a childhood development expert called Dr. Bruno Bettelheim. He was uh, very popular in those days. And his theory is that autism is caused by refrigerator mothers. Now, uh, nobody believes that anymore. Nobody, uh, that's been discredited. That was followed by the vaccine theory, and that was similarly discredited. Uh, nobody really knows why some people are autistic. They think it's a genetic component. It tends to run in families. Um, so I'm, I'm not a scientist. I won't you know, go into the biology of it. But uh, if you were born with the, the genetic components for autism, and you also had a refrigerator mother, well, that's a double whammy. Um, which is not to, to say I didn't love my mother. My mother was beautiful, alluring, remote, and I, I adored her. <laughs> um, but she was also like the Snow Queen in Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tale, the epitome of cold reason. She believed that you could just will yourself to be normal. or you will your, she, she would tell me, and I've complained about everything. She would tell me about some child who broke their spine when they were nine and uh, 
out of sheer willpower, grew up to become an Olympic spinner, <laughs> ran a three-minute mile or something. And this was constant with her, you know? And she actually believed this, and the, that I did not will myself to be normal or successful or prosperous or to have friends. That meant that the, I wasn't trying hard enough, that I was lazy, selfish, and so forth. Also, um, Hans Christian Andersen, many people feel that he himself was an Aspie. And I have a certain uh, relationship with Hans Christian Andersen uh, because we had some certain something in common. Hans Christian Andersen apparently never had a normal sexual life. He fell in love with one unattainable object after another. Uh, he, uh, he fell in love with Jenny Wind, the Swedish nightingale and opera singer. He proposed marriage to her. She turned him down. He fell in love with other people, um, both men and women, and who all, all turned him down. Uh, he probably uh, um, put this into his uh, fairy tale, The uh, Little Mermaid, which is, of course, uh, a statement of unrequited love. And uh, this is a lot like what happened to me. Um, I, I um, don't know what I, I call it the Artemis syndrome. Artemis was the uh, goddess of the chase, also a virgin goddess of the moon. And uh, to me, it was always the thrill of the chase. Uh, that's, and I think that's why a lot of Aspies are, are considered to be stalkers when they don't really mean to be. Uh, you, we have a hard time telling what's uh, an acceptable object of our desire and what's not. And I fell in love with one unattainable person after another. Uh, mostly, I fell in love with people that, uh, people that were popular, people that were handsome, people that were the center of life and that were normal, accepted, uh, because I wanted to be like them. And I thought, if I attached myself to somebody like that, uh, I would be like that. I, uh, I was thrown out of college for uh, stalking um, a student president. <laughs> I thought if I were the student president's girlfriend, everybody would love me because they all loved him. Unfortunately, um, he didn't see it that way, and neither did the college. So. <laughs> but uh, Hans Christian Andersen had, had a, a very similar problem, so I decided to honor him in, in the choice of, of title. OK, that will be fine. Um, there were a couple of teachers I had in high school. Uh, there was a Mr. McAldiff, and Mrs. Beauvais, but you know, the high school I went to was very big, and it was a centralized school, and it was like a factory, and they really, unfortunately, there really wasn't any way to give me personal attention. And how did you find your therapist? Okay. Okay. Um, Aunt Rose uh, had a neighbor. She was about my age, but she was a friend of Aunt Rose's. Uh, Aunt Rose used to garden, and this other lady gardened, and they became friends. And she was interning as a social worker for, and she she recommended me to to the uh, therapist she'd been interning for. And she in turn, she's a social worker, and she referred me to um, a psychiatrist that she was friends with. Um, as a child, I, I was pretty good. Uh, as a teenager, you know, when I was alone, when I was in, in regression, no, I didn't. I ceased to care, and I didn't. I did have a lot of time trouble, but just because I didn't have the energy and or the desire to, I didn't see the sense of it. Well, in college, I put my a lot of. A lot, a lot of the same thing, you know, then I was, um, I was a really dysfunctional young person. I, I wanted to become a student of evolutionary. I, I just, I went crazy. I was out demonstrating every day. But when I did pay attention, I did, I did do it. In graduate school, in law school, I, I, I was able to do the work. But probably not as well as if I had really concentrated. I, I was never an all-A student. After you were diagnosed, what particular kind of medication did that give you? Yeah. At that point? Right, yes. And not until that point? Not until that point. I had never taken medication or 
psychological medic medication. My parents, unfortunately, didn't encourage it. My parents thought it was, um, my father uh, and my mother ran um, a nursing home. Where actually, it turned out it was just a really a small convalescent home for uh, outpatients from the Veterans Association. And they had to give these veterans, so many of them you know, had PTSD or other you know, shell shock or whatever, you know, they had to give them medications and they, their view that the medications were just to make them manageable. And that they gave me the impression that the purpose of medication was to make you a zombie so other people could deal with you. So they did not encourage me to, um, to go that way. Now, when I was diagnosed, uh, I was also diagnosed with anxiety and depression, which is um, common for people with Asperger's. Asperger's itself, of course, there's no medication for. It's not a, not a mental disease or anything. So I do take uh, medication for, um, I take uh, bupropion and um, clonopin. Do any of your nieces and nephews show indications of Asperger's? Well, I don't have any nieces and nephews. My brother married late, and I, um, my brother does. My aunt had, had a lot. My aunt, yes, my mother's sister, yes, um, my aunt Bubbles. And my, my, my mother's father, who actually I only knew when he was older, but when I, by the time I knew him, he was very laconic, very um, withdrawn. Uh, so I, I really can't say because I only knew him when he was, was uh, older. But my aunt Bubbles is, is reclusive. Um, I tend to think my mother, and I can't call say my mother had autistic tendencies because she, when she had no friends, she said she didn't need friends. She was very aloof, very, very cold, very aloof, very um, self-contained. But when she wanted to, she could put on social graces. She could like switch it on. If she was going out to a big dinner, you know, and trying to impress people, then she would, you know. And she had married early in life, so she always had my father. But I think my mother may have been a carrier, if, if that's possible, you know. My brother has his Asperger's, never diagnosed. Yes. He's older than that, too. Um, he did say some things, but do you do that? Yes, 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 I do. Would um, you mean catastrophizing? Or? Just like, you mean catastrophizing? Thinking, making no, no, things worse? It's or it's like special interest, yeah. He the whole movie. Yeah. You know, and, and, and he, he, um, he has his fixations, uh, which aren't based totally in reality. Yeah. And aren't totally reciprocated. Yes. Um, but the fixations are, are, are really strong. Yes, you mean on other people? Hmm? Like on other people? Yeah. Yeah, well that's what I had, and, and that's... And, um, well, uh, when he was in college, he, he went to Iceland and he made some friends, and he, he fixates on, you know, on Iceland. He keep going to Iceland. Because he was happy there. Hmm? He was happy there. Well, and we still have these friends, so we go with Yeah. Them. That's probably a good idea. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, lots of people with Asperger's like other countries, you know. Um, I've actually been to Iraq. I was in Iraq in, in, in 93. Um, and I, I loved it, although <coughs> circumstances, I never got back there. Um, but a lot of Aspies do like, they like other cultures because other cultures don't consider them weird. They consider them weird because they're Americans, not weird because, uh, you know. Another thing that drives us crazy, he puns constantly. He what? Puns. Oh, yeah. Puns. Constantly. And I understood that that was, there were a lot of Asperger's who could do that. I, I don't know if they pun, but a lot of times we have, like, humor that make jokes that nobody else thinks is funny. And, and that, that tended to get me into a lot of trouble, you know. <laughs> and, Yeah, there, there is. I don't, you know, know how much is nature, how much is nurture. I mean, I don't want to sound like that. I know, I know. I, I, I realize that, you know, I mean. Um, like, I, I don't consider myself totally normal. I mean, not that. I, mean, you know, I, 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 I think, totally normal, I, mean, let's be I think 
the hallmark of autism is uh, basically social, un un inability to social functioning, and the other stuff is sort of. And, and if you consider yourself normal, yeah. let's, let's be honest, I mean, you know, that's not right in general. You know? Yeah, well, I, as I say, I don't know uh, how much how much I was born with and how much basically came because of, of uh, misfortune, unfortunate circumstances, you know. I don't know if I would have been as weird as if I had had a different kind of upbringing, but. Can you give me one more question? Yes. Well, in, in my day, I don't think that they, I don't think they ever really had any social skills training at, at school. Um, they basically, you were basically on your own, um, and uh, I, 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 you know, until, actually until recently, I really wasn't aware of the, the sort of supports they have now, you know, and that, uh, uh, because in my day, it was basically sink or swim. Did you ever look up Alexis? Yes, yes, I did. Uh, I'll tell you about Alexis because this is actually it. Oh, wait, I'll tell you about Alexis. This is um, kind of a strange story about Alexis. Um, when I moved back to Crow, to the Aunt Rose, one of the reasons I moved back because of Alexis. You know, I dreamed about Alexis every night. You see, there's another thing I used to dream that I was back in Crow uh, almost every night. Like I had a wife like Roy Orbison in saying dreams. But Alexis had gone away to college and she hadn't come back. I thought she was sure she'd come back for Christmas or, you know, for family business. But unfortunately, ironically, a couple months after I moved in with Aunt Rose, her parents sold their house and they retired. They moved to North Carolina. And they moved to a town called Hendersonville. And uh, a couple years ago, I had a tour group from Hendersonville up in Kaika. And, you know, I just said, has anybody heard of, you know, Alexis? And they, uh, and uh, apparently, it, it turns out she is a chaplain at a, a hospital in, in Hendersonville. Uh, Alexis, um, her family was kind of artsy. That's one of the reasons they had this war for me. And she married this opera singer who was very uh, was about 20 years older than she was. Uh, and he died, which I didn't know at the time. I didn't actually heard the story, but I didn't relate to Alexis. But he died on, on stage at the Metropolitan Opera. Uh, and uh, there's kind of a, a strange story about that. They were doing an opera by a Czech opera writer. And uh, it was about a 300-year-old opera diva who had, uh, her father had been an alchemist and he had discovered uh, some potion for immortality. And she had taken a, a drink of it and she had lived 300 years with this very walk. And she had to find this formula again. And it was, the formula was in this old dusty file that was kept in a law firm in Prague. And on the opening scene, Alexis's husband is in the walk work and he's going up to get this uh, old file and he's singing a song saying, too bad you can only live so long. And he was kind of part of that. And so, um, you know, while I thought she was going to have to be a after, she was apparently, she had her own uh, A lot of book learning, and I'm, I'm very knowledgeable about a lot of things. Certain things I'm very, very knowledgeable about, and I also have a good imagination, and maybe that is a compensation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 
Hi, uh, first I just want to say thank you for sharing your story. Um, I'm just wondering now, where you are now in your life, what would you identify as the most important supports or strategies that keep you um, at your best now? Like you mentioned medication, but yeah. surely there must be other pieces. Yeah, of your well, life. but the people I work with at Historic Cousin Valley have been very supportive of me. Um, that also is important. The, the people I work with um, are sort of an artsy crowd. Um, they're, and they, artsy people tend to be more, more tolerant of, of other people's quirkiness rather than if you try to work in a law firm, you're not really going to get as much tolerance. So I would say that the people I work with are, are, are really, are like an extended family. Uh, I also have a horse. His name is Silverado. Um, I had ridden horseback uh, from at different times in my life. Um, as I say, Aspies tend to get along better with animals than people, and horseback riding is good, it relieves stress. And then when Ambrose died, um, I decided to buy a horse. His name is Silverado, and um, he's really helped me. That a couple kitty cats. I have a question. Um, do you have any uh, recommendations for our future teachers, how they maybe move forward to support I, I, yeah, I, um, I do. I think, I think the greatest regret I have that I was not diagnosed early in life is the fact that I could have used some career guidance. You know, I wasted a long period of time in my life, um, you know, either trying to fit myself into jobs which I wasn't um, qualified for or just not knowing what to do. Uh, most people with Asperger's have certain special interests. Like, uh, for instance, as a child, you know, I was obsessed with Greek mythology and uh, Near Eastern religions in general, you know, and uh, if you want to someday you know, a conversation with me, I can talk your <laughs> head off about it. And uh, it was not encouraged. You know, people said to me, you know, that's all nonsense, it's not going to get you a job. Why don't you concentrate on something, you know, that's, that's going to, some like business or something that's going to, you know, be productive. But, Yet, you know, I could have gone into academic world, I could have into archaeology, I could have gone into a museum type job. And in fact, in Kaikit, one of the things, good things about Kaikit is that I actually get to use that knowledge because there's a lot of, uh, of the sculpture that's of, of ancient gods and goddesses and I'm the go-to person that, to explain about that. So I would say that you, have to, you should foster their, their special interests. And, and don't make them ashamed of their special interests. Um. I don't know if you addressed the question, uh, but I know you mentioning you had a brother and the relationship was yeah. so much strained. Upon the passing of your parents, I don't know if your brother's still with you, but yeah, was there ever uh, with me reconciliation or some kind of relationship that was strengthened in the loss of your parents with you and your brother things? Are they still somewhat the same? Yeah, it's still, you know, it, it's, it's very hard to explain what happened with my brother. Um, I believe he's an Aspie himself, he's never been diagnosed. I just don't know how to explain, he just doesn't, didn't seem, he was just totally, he's just totally indifferent. And uh, I did try, I tried at various times, but he tried so hard, he tried to break through with a glass wall and, and, and he didn't. Now after, you know, my father died, um, I, I did call, I do call him up sometimes, he did go to, I did go to his wedding, he was married two years ago. Um, you know, and I, I call him up, but he never calls me. Um, I call him up, how's everything? All right, <laughs> how are you doing? Okay, you got a job? No. <laughs> nothing, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with us now, you know. I, but then there's nothing right either, so, you know. And I just don't, it's one of those things, you know, you just, if somebody doesn't really want you in their life, you know, what can you do? And he lives in Boston. If I live, I suppose if I live five miles away, it would be different. I'd be over there, you know, visiting him once in a while. I think that's all the time we have. I want time for to sell the books. Uh -huh. and would like to join us for reception. Shut up, thank you so much. Oh, okay. Thank you.